Our first panel, entitled What Tipped the Scale, will be led by award-winning journalist who's written extensively on global environmental change and risk for over 30 years. He's a senior investigator for ProPublica, and since 2016, he's been a strategic advisor at the National Geographic Society for Environmental and Journalistic Science. Please welcome Andy Revkin. <laughs> Beer. It's great to be here in many, many ways. This, uh, you know, this is my 35th year writing about our journey, mostly about the environment, uh, but about uh, many other aspects of this journey that we're on. And, and I, I joined the staff here a uh, hundred and something days ago, so I'm now a full-time National Geographic explorer in the sense that I'm exploring how do we make communication matter on this journey. Uh, and today, we're going to start with this question, what tipped the scale? How do we get here? That, how did we get here? Let's just reflect very briefly in the year 1800, which is not that long ago, certainly not in geological time scales, there were one billion people on the planet. That's everybody, you know, teenagers, babies. Now there are just one billion teenagers on the planet. Just wrap your head around that one thought. Everyone in this room, <laughs> let's see, yeah, yeah, everyone in this room, everyone online who's watching has, has been a teenager, unless you're a kid still. And you know what that feels like. It's this uh, sense of, wow, you know, look what I can do. And if you just sort of, put uh, oil where testosterone was, fossil fuels, you get that idea, at least the male part of us, zoom, zoom mode. And you look at every graph that I've been writing about for 35 years, and uh, actually in 2016, there was this international report called The Great Acceleration. It's kind of fortunate that we'll have an astronaut with us this morning because it's like we've just been on a launching pad and just taken off. And the question is, do we go into a smooth orbit? Or does something break up and uh, do we fall apart and have a jagged kind of transition through the century? You'll hear about that through the course of this morning. Right now we're gonna talk about this pulse of us that's taken us so far. And just to give you a sense that there's good news and bad news always, uh, someone handed me just this morning, today's uh, Washington Post has this great article, Chesapeake Bay is the healthiest it's been in 33 years. <laughs> so, we're having these little victories, uh, but at the same time, when you look at the global scale, the things I've been writing about forever, it seems like, um, are different. Uh, I brought along an artifact. I have to keep it in plastic. Um, this is my first article on global warming, 1988. So June 23rd this year, which is just um, in about a week, is the uh, 30th anniversary of global warming becoming a news story. Jim Hansen, a NASA, t a NASA sa scientist, testified at a hearing in D.C. It was a hot day, the air conditioning wasn't working in the hearing room, that he posited that the greenhouse effect was detected and was changing our climate now, now as of 30 years ago. The atmospheric concentration of CO2 at that year was 350, which is the number that Jim later determined was the safe number, and we're now zoomed past 410. It's a cumulative gas. It's not like the old-fashioned pollution we did. We cleaned up really well in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s uh, here in the developed countries. It stays in the atmosphere, so it's building like, like credit card debt. That you, and you know, the funny thing about credit cards is just slowing your spending, does that take away your debt? No, so slowing our emissions of greenhouse gases does not solve the climate problem. You have to go to zero. Even as we're going to nine billion plus you know, in this, by mid-century and who knows what beyond that, that is a profoundly different challenge than the things we've done great work on so far. We have a great panel to discuss this this morning, and uh, I'd like to bring them out so we can get going. Victoria Herman, uh, Ian Stewart, Emma Maris, and Leland Melvin. So, <laughs> I didn't show the back of the magazine yet. You, some of you saw this this morning. Just to tell you how hard this is, and that it's not all about um, sort of rules and regulations, and it, if you're not looking inward, you know, at, our pers at, at the inner environment, you're missing some things. Because, you know, I was at a prize-winning science magazine, I'm here now, and uh, I was the senior editor, and look what was selling our magazine back then. <laughs> tobacco. So the tobacco industry was paying me to warn you about, the, uh, about coal and oil. That's a really weird thing to get your head around as a journalist. Like, so I was sitting in that newsroom, and I was not staging a walkout or something. Uh, and you're exploring, uh, Victoria is the director of the Arctic Institute, and uh, you've been doing a lot of social science, like, you know, interviewing people on the front lines of climate change in the Arctic. Um, 
your PhD thesis was on media coverage of Alaskan change. So how much of this is internal versus external in that sense? You know, wh when you get out there, what are, you, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Yeah, I think there are two different conversations happening. So in communities along the Arctic's coastline all across the region, people are talking about how to adapt to the impacts they're seeing now. So for them, the tipping point has already happened. It happened 20 years ago, and now they're trying to figure out how to adapt, what resources they need, and maybe how to move away from coastlines that won't be there next year if a fall storm comes. That's a very different conversation than what we're having here in DC or in more southern cities where we're still talking about when the scales will tip or maybe we're at that point now and what we need to do to limit greenhouse gas emissions so we don't see those type of consequences here in coastal cities. So we're kind of at different points on the scale and that means that we're having different conversations internal to communities and then here in DC. And I bet you've run into all kinds of vantage points on Arctic change as you've been up there. Uh, I, I've been to some events where uh, there was a, Ar the Arctic Circle, it's in, in Iceland, where you, yeah. she just got back here through a snow, uh, windstorm and a snowstorm from uh, rural Iceland uh, last night, this last morning. Last night, last night. <laughs> uh, a, a National Geographic explorer, you know, exploring <laughs> definitely involves these elements. But when I was at this um, Arctic Circle event in, in Iceland, a bunch of Arctic companies and countries were there. It was felt like a festival. It didn't feel like an oh my God thing. So how much of a, of a mix of those kinds of perceptions do you see? I mean, the urgency is real, uh, and people are talking about the immediate impacts, but at the same time, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of people who really care, and I think that people are trying to find ways forward together, and you see that in a place that brings together business and policy and community champions, scientists, all in one room to figure out how we can learn from each other and move forward. And in the Arctic, that's sometimes a difficult conversation to have because most of the local economies are based on oil. So how do you talk about you know, eliminating oil globally where that is an incredibly important part of a local economy that might not have another option to go to next yeah. year? Norway is the place where I've seen the biggest paradox. They, um, they're, almost all of their domestic energy comes from hydro, their electricity, so that's why they're big on Teslas because they can take oh. advantage of that. Uh, they have real big subsidies, but they're exporting and, and searching for more oil even as they're doing that. It gets to be really paradoxical. So Ian, you've taken this journey from, you're at the University of Plymouth mm. directing the Earth, Sustainable Earth yeah. Institute. But you started out in geology. Uh, what <laughs> drew you toward uh, from just studying rocks to studying our future? Yeah. <clears throat> See, Not just I, studying, but communicating. Well, I, I chucked my job in in 2002 as a, a university lecturer, and, uh, and I decided to go and try and make teleprograms. And the first thing that I got when I, I knocked on the door was, w once they'd stopped thinking it was archaeology, I was doing geology, they said, you want us to do a program on stones? <laughs> and it was weird, because I'd never thought of geology as about stones. To me, it was the planet, how it worked, what it meant for us. And, and when, we, when I managed to find language to convey that, then, then everything started kicked off and I think this idea of the dynamism what it means for people is the key because you know the planet is amazing and you know I mean, we're saying that we're in the mecca the heart of demonstrating what an amazing planet we live in but when you go to the, I mean we get the chance to go to these places and talk to people and that's the transformative bit for me I mean that you must be the same is that it's when you speak to an individual I remember going to Greenland exactly as you described it was Greenland it was Umanak and the, went out on the ice, the ice was breaking up because it was breaking up a month earlier. And the guy was out and I said, this must be terrible. And he says, no, it's great. And I said, what do you mean it's great? And he says, well, in the winter, I cut a hole in the ice and I'd lie there waiting to shoot a sail. In the summer, when the ice breaks, I get out of my boat. So it kind of brought home the two things that, yeah, the science was happening and it was exactly as he described, but as winners and losers. And Greenland was saying, we're going to get rich, we're opening up the oil and gas, we're bringing up the mining. You know, and so th that is a tricky thing. You, you're absolutely um, right about the changes happening on the edges, and people like us are good, you know, lucky enough to go to those edges and see it. But most people aren't. Most people are stuck right. in Western Europe, the UK, or here in the East Coast and don't see it. So how do you convey that to them? It's really tricky. Yeah. Well, the the biggest rock is the one strange rock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and the fact that you become a communicator as well as a, you know a, a, an analyst is really. But I had to step out to do that. I don't think you would actually know. But uh, you know that was one of the. And that's choices. 
would you say that the balance, we're talking about tipping the balance, tipping the skills. In academia, has the balance tipped toward being a communicator? Uh, you know, I, I was in academia for six years and, and I still get the sense that it's not something that's encouraged. I, I, think, we can talk about that. I think it varies. I think, in, funny enough, in the UK now, for a whole set of structural reasons, it's changing and that's because there's money attached to getting out and doing this kind of stuff. I think until money is there, until if you're an academic, you're actually incentivized to do it. It will, it will happen as soon as you're incentivized. If you're not incentivized, why do it? There's a whole bunch of other pressures on you. Right. Have you found that, Victoria? You know, the, the, I was talking with Ralph Cicerone, who uh, passed away recently, but he was the head of the National Academy of Sciences about this. What can the academy do to uh, foster more of a communicative, solution-oriented fixation in academia? And he said it probably will take uh, deaths of, of like heads of departments and deans <laughs> before that could happen. But do you feel it's really changing? Yeah, I do feel it's really changing. And I, I was just at the National Academies for the first part of 2018. And you can see the change. And in part, that's because a new generation is coming who has been trained because there's been resources to think about communication as they're doing their research. And that's really important because if you think about it, the last generation wasn't trained communicators. They were trained scientists, they were trained social scientists, geologists, but they weren't trained STEM or STEAM communicators. Um, and that's really important to changing the system. Systems sure. are individuals, so you have to change individuals to change systems. Right, and just the, all this past week, we've had some great sessions here at National Geographic on communica being communicative, uh, making information matter. That's the, the issue right now isn't so much telling a good story as it is cutting through all the noise. And Emma, you've just come on as uh, one of our, uh, our, our storytelling, our media innovation fellows. Uh, you caught my attention and many others uh, in the environmental community as a journalist when you wrote your book, Rambunctious Garden, yeah. which is sort of like, you know, the earth is a changed place because of our human pulse. Uh, it's very disrupted. There are species blinking out, but, there's still, but the system can still be very functional and rich. Uh, it, it, you know, the thing that, I can't remember if this was in your book, but I, I was doing some reporting a few years ago and um, I really was shocked to learn that tumbleweed, this iconic fixture in all of our Westerns, Big Lebowski, remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is an imported, in, invasive, not invasive, well, it is invasive, but it's a, it was an introduced species. Hey, right. you know, like, wow, how do you get across, how do you get over that kind of stuff? So where, what do you think about, when you think about the tip scale, you know, how did we get here? And then your sense of where do we, how do we get out of this mess? Well, you know, I think it's interesting to think about what, when did the scale tip? I mean, my sense of it is that it tipped at, like at least 15,000 years ago um, <laughs> when, uh, you know, humanity as a species started expanding out and, and, and especially when, when agriculture came in. Um, you can start seeing the effects of human society in the geological record that far back. I mean, you can even see uh, signatures in, of the deforestation, of the reforestation that happened after the Black Death, when everybody died and all their farms uh, turned back to forest. Mm -hmm. So we've been influencing the climate for a long time. We've been influencing ecosystems for a long time here in North America by driving, help driving extinct mastodons and mammoths and ground sloths and. And all of those, all of the ecosystems that we think of as the sort of right, timeless wilderness, almost all of them were created by humans, either through intentional management or through these, the ripple effects from these extinctions. And so once I sort of had that realization that, that all the stuff we were trying to get back to was already a humanized stuff, that really changed the way that I thought about what our goals should be. And, and made me just less interested in going back and more interested in, in going forward to something that's maybe going to be different looking or unfamiliar, but could still be diverse and flourishing and rich and you know, not just a bunch of pavement. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I've been working on for the last you know, quite a few years is trying to envision that future that isn't tied to the past. That's great, yeah. Can I just interject? Because this is something in the Arctic that you get a lot where people imagine you know, a nostalgic past where, mm. and they bring it into the future saying the Arctic is pristine, right? The Arctic, and there's a slippery slope between pristine and peopleless, and then this need to preserve and protect. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, how do you kind of pull people beyond that narrative? Because I think a lot of us consciously or unconsciously you know, we think wilderness, we think pristine, we right. think, you know, something that we should go back to instead of 
consider where we are now and then go forward from. So how do you get people there? Well, one thing I do is I talk about the sort of the white man stepping off the boat moment and how a lot of times when we look at an ecosystem and we think, how should this ecosystem look? Like, how should we restore it to? We kind of, our go-to is like when Captain Cook showed up or Lewis and Clark showed up or, um, and in fact, this goes down to even like the very granular scale. When I was visited, giving a lecture in Ohio, I found out that this county in Ohio defines a native plant by whether or not it existed in the county when some dude named Ebenezer Zane showed up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so, and once you sort of, sh so I'll show s pictures of all of these white dudes in more and more ridiculous looking facial hair, and it just becomes so clear how arbitrary this is right. and how they culture. They define the line when it started. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that mm. kind of realizing that arbitrariness and then just learning more about all the stuff that happened before the white guy got off the boat, all the indigenous management, intentional, all the unintentional changes that go back thousands of years, and that stuff is fascinating too. But there's some words, have you, have you heard of this Pleistocene Park idea? Yeah. Up in, and that's kind of interesting. So, so one of the things is these mad guys in Chersky, Siberia, want to bring back the, the, the big mammals because the idea is that, you know, that that'll help the tundra go back to this natural yeah. things. And including, you know, I, I kind of half-heartedly involve in trying to get the DNA of mammoths and, and, and trying to do that. And it does bring this idea of what is the best past to go to, which is right. ridiculous because we're obviously right. going, going forward. So it's really interesting. Right. So Leland, you know, you, you are a, among a very small cohort of the 7.6, uh, 7.65 billion people on the planet who have ah. seen the planet from this unique vantage point. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you've done a, I mean, every, every astronaut I've met has, has had this outward facing, you know, message to the world, uh, but you've been particularly energetic in all that, and I, do you worry about, uh, given the, the Zoom trajectory we're on, uh, how do you sustain a sense of, uh, when you're talking to kids, for example, of, uh, that there's a new way to look at things? So is doom and gloom, uh, does that work? Is it even correct? Well, you know, doom and gloom, I had some doom and gloom when this election took place, and I, <laughs> and I probably shouldn't be saying that, but I, you know, there was so much rhetoric, so much noise, and then I just dialed back and I said, let's think positively. Let's think about things that are, that you can affect change on. And, and you know, with a lot of the kids that I talk to, I try to tell them that, you know, the planet is a really diverse and beautiful place from space. You see all these people working together and living together. And I was in space where people used to fight against the Russians and the Germans, and we coexisted in harmony. And if we don't, we die. Right. You know, if I flip the wrong switch and Yuri's like, Leela, no, you don't flip that switch, we all die. <laughs> and so I think if we can bring this perspective shift down to the planet, I mean, I, I saw systems and things working together that I had never seen on the planet. And you go around it every 90 minutes. You see a sunrise and a sunset every 45. And I was breaking bread with, you know, Russians, Germans, the first female commander, Dr. Peggy Whitson. So it was African-American, Asian-American, French, German, Russian. We're all breaking bread, listening to Sade Smooth Operator. <laughs> and I'm looking at the planet like, oh my God, I'm, I'm flying over my hometown, Lynchburg, Virginia. <laughs> and then Leo Iharts is from Paris. And we're five minutes later, we're over Paris, you know? And, <laughs> His parents are probably eating a meal and, and just this collective of people working together. And so I try to talk to them about inspiration through working together as one race, mm -hmm. the human race, because there's no such thing as race, right? And us being one civilization. And I, I, think, I think if you show the beauty, if you help people fall in love with the planet, as you know, all of us are science communicators, and, show the things that are beautiful, show the systems that are, are having problems, but it's not the planet that's gonna have the problem. The planet's not fragile. We're the fragile ones. We're gonna get burped out, you know, by what we're doing, and the planet will go about its way and it's figured out, and so it's really us working together to maintain our human race. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was just a thought, because you know, this goes back to the point I made earlier, which is we're kind of on the stage because we've had these amazing opportunities. And then we communicate it out to people who have not had these opportunities. Right. And I think making that connection, I think when people you know, talk to us one by one to one, it's very easy to, to convince them and convey that sense of excitement. But 
to do it on mass is really difficult. And it's this behavioral change that needs to happen. And, and this right. scale of the problem is just so difficult. I think that's one of the things that One Strange Rock was trying to do, was not trying to beat you over the head with science, but right. to let you see how the things are connected and how beautiful the planet really is mm. from space and in a micro level also, mm. and, and in the oceans. You know, All these things working together as one huge system and right. how it can be beautiful. And, mm -hmm. And it, you know that's a that's a grander scale to show you know ten episodes of yeah, stuff, yeah. right? And you know having Will Smith there doesn't hurt, you know. But <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but yeah, it's to communicate the beauty of it. So who do you think you'd want? We can't get everybody up into orbit to have this enthralling uh, view directly. But is there? Do you envision a way to uh, have at least a, like who would you take up with you if you could go back up again to to get that view? Who might make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a letter to our, our current president, and I, 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 I said in the letter, I said, why don't you talk to your good friend, Mr. Putin, he can send you up on a Soyuz rocket. That's true. <laughs> and, and let you see that we truly have to work together and to see the magnificence. You get this thing called the orbital perspective when you look back at the planet, and it's a cognitive shift. You change in space when you see the planet and how magnificent it is, and most astronauts do get this. And when I came home, I wanted to see how I could help more people feel what I felt, because you know they're taxpayers, so they sent me to space. I was trying to give back some too, but um, it's such a, such a change. And you know, there's been 562 people that have flown in space. How can we get more people to get this cognitive shift so that they can think about themselves working together as one family? And that's that's my goal. Yeah, I'm going to throw this out to all of you. That you know, we're working on some platforms here at National Geographic that might be able to build an experience and a sort of a, an accessibility to information globally that uh, could make. It feels to me exciting because the, you know, the downside of connectivity right now that emerged uh, recently is that we're all you can get into a filter bubbles. You know, we mm -hmm. don't tend to use these tools right. to their full potential. Um, and the, the upside, of course, is that I can look right now. Well, we could have a live experience with one of our uh, explorers in a cave, uh, you know, underground. And there, there were people at this Explorers Festival with, uh, where you, a you, uh, student soon, could control an underwater ROV. Or, uh, so, but, but can we get ahead of our, can we build the capacity to use those tools in that way? You've all been interacting with the public enough to know, uh, and then to see people leave and, you know, check, check on the sports or stock market or whatever. Do you have a sense of a to-do list yourself on how to use these tools to, to get that better uh, side of it? Yeah, I mean, I think of tools as the starting point, mm -hmm. not the end point, right? So my intent in every communication is to connect someone in the audience to the next person they need to talk to, because I think that building out platforms online like Nat Geo is doing is incredible and really necessary, but don't forget about human interaction without the people here on stage in the room. So what can we do to connect people to other community members who are seeing climate change happening um, without me being that mediator in between what's happening. And I think for me over the next few years, I'm building a skills-based volunteering platform. So connecting engineers, lawyers, historians with communities in need of adaptation. And it's that's where you get learning, right? And get the people to care because they're now engaged. They're engaged with other people rather than a tool, a platform, or an expert. And that's that's yeah. the end game. So you can capture their attention, but then let them, let it self-propagate, essentially, yeah. yeah. I, I, think, I, I think you have to feed the people, too. You know, when you break bread with people <laughs> around the table and you're showing them, you're trying to dispel these myths, that these things that they've learned from their family members or other people, and they're in their tribe, and everyone's in their little tribe thinking what they want to think but you come around the table and you break bread and you start having the conversation. And I was in Russia on one of my first trips to Moscow to train. I'll never forget this little boy thought I had a tail because he had heard that black people had tails. And I'm like, wow. dude, I don't have a tail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Did you have to we prove were, it? <laughs> and we were sitting down, I was learning Russian and we were eating and you know, he looked back there, he's looking for the tail. And, 
I don't have one. So, you know, right. just breaking it down to mm -hmm. the simple level of let's share and let's tell stories. Yeah. Let's I think we're at a really interesting time, aren't we? Because the technology is astonishing and, and the ability to create these massive environments and the internet to disseminate, you know, some villager in Nepal can go to an internet cafe and can get this stuff. So that's extraordinary. But I think also if you look at the, the big frameworks we've got for the planet, the Sendai framework for disaster risk, the COP21 mm. and the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, they are, they're all talking about a people-centered approach, but bringing people in. And, and I think the two of them are a kind of a tension and especially when we're talking about training people to communicate or helping them communicate, is the key thing at the end of the day is that human contact. And, and I think, how do we merge? So this is a challenge. How do we merge this high tech stuff, which is brilliant, but also not lose the emotional attachment to people? And that, that's right. what you're getting at. Yeah, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I think that uh, early childhood education is really important. Natural history is really important. Just running around outside and playing is really important. Um, and, and I think you know, all the crisis stuff that scale tipping over can be too much to yep. take on unless you have a baseline love for the world yep. that you've already got instilled in you from childhood. So you know, s skipping rocks is, I think, part of addressing climate change. There you go. And there's a lot of physics there too. So yes. <laughs> about science. Stones. It all comes back to stones. Hey. Yeah. And, and building and building things. I mean, getting mm. getting kids to know that if they have a there's a problem in their community, you know, address the problem and say, how do I fix this? And let them be the ones that help fix the problem. I I was talking to Will. I am had a program in his community where he grew up, where the kids were using GIS data to find out where the houses were they probably had lead paint, oh, where wow. kids were eating lead paint. And so these kids went to city council, raised $200,000 to paint the houses. Mm -hmm. So they were using the data, they had a problem, and they mm -hmm. solved it in their community. So building, creating community, and then radiating out from that to save the world, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, Ian, uh, you know, we, I, don't, we, I don't want to jump the gun too much into the next panel, which is how do we restore balance. Uh, there's still some real things that really scare me. And we we uh, were at a meeting a couple of weeks ago in Mexico City on disaster risk reduction and the role of communication in changing, uh, changing risk. And we're on a planet that is very dynamic. Just look at Guatemala and right now. And that's like a small taste of yeah. what's locked in place. Uh, the Himalayan Front Range, there's a, one of the explorers I met this week uh, from India is working on simple building methods that can make a building, you know, we're the biggest building boom in the history of the planet. There'll be yeah. more structures built in the next 20 years than have been built in all of human history by square footage. And it's mostly being built by someone's uncle, not yeah. by an architect or, a, <laughs> or an engineer. Uh, and we, we, you know, it is important to sort of keep people in, in I think it's of urgency at the same time. It's this balance of a sense of urgency with people's normal life. So, for example, I work a lot in, uh, there's a big seismic pit to Istanbul, which is, is yeah. um, city of 14, 15 million people. We know an earthquake is going to come in the next couple of decades. And, I, and I'll go in there and I want to talk to people about earthquakes. And now Istanbul, Turkey is a, is a place that's got a lot of things going on, turmoil. So I'm telling people, hey, you've got to be worried about earthquakes. And they're kind of going, get in the queue. Yeah. You know, we're right, worried right, about right. terrorism. <laughs> We've got people getting locked up. And, 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 I, and then probably someone else is going to come in the next week and another sign and say, you should be worried about flooding. And they don't have volcanoes, but if they did, someone would come in and say, you should worry about yeah, volcanoes. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's business about, there's a disconnect between people's normal life. Most people are just hanging in there. Exactly. And then we're trying to tell them about things that might happen in 10 years or right. 20 years yeah. or 30 years. And they just go, you know what, it's too much, it's overload. Although in Istanbul, I was there um, nine years ago, I did a big story for the New York Times on cities and earthquakes. And I was take, go, going around community by community in Istanbul. There's a Swiss nonprofit group that was, uh, they had distributed uh, like 60 sort of container size sets of gear so that when mm. the, the quake hits, the community has some capacity because they said like 48 hours of after a quake like that, actually days after, there's still no real yeah. organized response. And what was interesting was one of these uh, small units that had been trained, informal volunteer trainers, had these tools for extricating people from an earthquake and a, bo a terrorist bombing had happened. And they were able to respond uh, because they had the capacity, the general capacity to respond as a, as a local mm. uh, hub. And that gets to this point, I think, of distributed capacity, uh, basic skill sets that can then, with all of our adaptive genius, you know, 
you can say, oh, I've got this stuff for this purpose, but here I can use it there. I see that increasingly around. And, and this gets to this whole question of um, top down versus bottom up. Yeah. You know, the Paris Agreement is the top down thing, but it's basically there to just acknowledge all the things people are gonna do from the bottom up. Every country, no one's bound by that. So when, you, when you've gone around, what's your sense of, is this really gonna be building capacity for us all to do things that are clever and adaptive and, and empathetic, or is it more like, a, does someone have to come in and save us from, from ourselves from the top? Hmm. You can ponder it. I don't know that we need someone to save us, but I think uh, you need both because you need the frameworks within which to work from the ground up to be as effective as you can. So you need regulations, right? You need the legal framework, you need the public investment, the financial investment for whether it's adaptation, it's mitigation, it's loss and damage, documenting things that we know we're going to lose. All of that is human based, right? It's the community champion, it's the community as a whole that is doing something but they need to be supported because while somewhere like DC or New York has a city budget to work with, Shishmaref Alaska does not. So right. you need a top down in some way to provide resources for already empowered communities to do what they want to do. Um, but I don't know that you can have one over the other, you need both. And I think scientists have a really critical role in making the link <clears throat> because you know the, gra the grassroots organization is great, but that's an energy from a community that's often doing it because they're disconnected politically. Yeah. So they often can't reach up equally. There's a top-down approach that doesn't involve it. But in a way, potentially, both sides can be trusted with scientists, particularly scientists are seen as a potential kind of conduit to do that. And I don't think scientists realize that until actually they're in there, that they could have that role. And I think a lot of scientists go in and then they leave and they you know, write the papers and, and that's kind of it. But I think there's something really important that we could be doing. Emma, on that front, um, you know, scientists, do they all have that perception of their role? No. Impressive. The IPCC, which I've been writing about since before it began in 1980, there was this moment in 2007 when they were releasing the third report, I think, and they had this big slide on the back of the impacts. It, it looked like you know, warning, 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 warning. And it had this feel to me, I think I began speaking about it after that, it, of Moses coming down from the mountain with his <laughs> Ten Commandments. You know, we're, he, we're warning you, you need to do what we think you should do. And on biology, it's kind of the same thing. You, you, when you were putting forth your thesis about a comfort level with this disrupted botany that we are living among, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you face some resistance. It was so a little pushback. What's the role? Is, are there multiple roles for science? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I, I think scientists sometimes want to have it both ways. They want to be seen as a sort of neutral party that just simply tells the, the truth about the way that the world is and is not biased. But then they also want everybody to just do listen to them and do what they say. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think it can sometimes be a little tricky. And I've been really interested to see how how this is playing out around CRISPR and gene drives, which is not only a sort of fascinating medical technology, but can also be potentially used to address some environmental problems. you give like problems. a 20 second sketch of what Yeah, so like, let's say you have, there was a great talk this week uh, by an ex uh, explorer who's working on these seabird islands where, where non-native mice are eating albatross chicks alive. Well, one approach is to rescue the albatross chicks, and that's what he was documenting, but another approach might be to release genetically engineered mice onto the island that would spread infertility genes so that all the mice would just die out. <laughs> um, and there are people actively working on this. I've written about it. With Zika, um, Zika virus too. Yeah, and the same thing, and, and, and it, you know, no less a person than E.O. Wilson has called for using genetic modification to drive uh, some mosquito species extinct because of their capacity to, to bring, you know, to carry disease. So we're potentially at the brink of, of being able to use to be able to do sort of ecological modification on a global scale. And everybody's talking about it as a sort of a technological problem to crack. And I think it's really important that we like make sure that it isn't just the, 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 you know, the boffins, as they say, yeah, 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 that are making these decisions and that the people, that everybody get involved and that everybody, I mean, the, the stakeholder group for something like that is like 7 billion people. Yeah. So how do you make a global decision about something uh, with such yeah. far-reaching implications? I think it's a really fascinating uh, question, and it can't be all left up to the experts. Leo, but, we're we're yeah. going to shift to, um, to uh, 
audience questions in a couple of minutes, but this, there's this other dimension here. When you're making your case for sustainability or for access to education or whatever, how much of it is um, quantitative and how much of it is about values and ethics? I think all of it is about values. Because if, if culturally, if you're going around, the, I mean, we're at Nat Geo, the Mecca, you know, it's like the world, right? If you're going around the world talking about, you know, like, can I say you need to do this, you need to do this, who is it based on? Is it the white man from right, exactly. this place who's saying that this is what you need to do mm -hmm. when they don't even understand the culture that they're actually in? Mm -hmm. And so I think the value of that culture has to be at the forefront of, of, of what you're going to be doing, and then you bring in the science portion of it. And that's understanding the people and the environment and the, the place that you're in. Yeah, uh, the, you know, I wrote this piece a few years ago when, um, after all this time, you know, going to the sea ice at the North Pole, going to the middle of the Amazon rainforest, uh, going to meetings and nuclear power plants and stuff, uh, it was when I went to the Vatican, 2014, I spent a week there at a meeting. The title of this meeting was so awesome. It was Sustainable Humanity, Sustainable Planet, Our Responsibility. And it should have had a question mark at the end because it was it's like a formula, you know. <coughs> and and, and the, the opening talk was by this cardinal, Maradiaga from Honduras, who's part of the Pope's kind of posse. And he, he's looking at this, the room is full of the room is full of like Nobel Prize winning economists and ecologists and and all the like. And he says, nowadays mankind is like a a, a technological giant and an ethical child. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, this I realized, you know, my reporting journey has all been around, we're kind of in a race between our potency, our awareness of its impacts in the environment, and our own inner awareness and sense of what do you do with that. Well, it's interesting because one potential down the road application of this genetic technology would be to make ourselves more ethical. So there are philosophers who talk about um, <laughs> moral, what do they call it, uh, you know, moral improvement, that we could engineer ourselves wow. to be more compassionate, more empathetic, to be able to see further down the generations. Um, it sounds terrifying. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, these decisions we might, maybe the, the version of this panel that's happening in 100 years, that's what they'll be discussing. Holy moly. Well, let's uh, see if there, I think we have mic runners, and we'll see if there's some questions out there. There's one right here, and then one over here, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much so far. Thank you. Hi, uh, great panel. Um, you seem though, you, you're preaching to the converted like us, so when does Scott Pruitt get invited to <laughs> a meeting like this? Yeah, there you go. Well, it's, it's having that meal. It's starting out with something that the person likes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then just having the discussion and showing, I mean, He showing likes freebies, you know, freebies? so maybe a free <laughs> lunch. <laughs> so we could do that. We could work that. But I, I think there's another thing, which is I think that uh, we need to, as, I, again, I'm kind of talking as a scientist here. I think the scientists need to engage with the political process. We, we often disconnect ourselves from it because we feel that's not our job. And I think that the closer we get to understanding how, what journalists need, for example, or what politicians need, these other audiences, we get better at translating ourselves for it. Because it's easy to have a pop at journalists don't, not getting a story right or politicians not getting a story right from a science perspective, but usually the, the problem has come from the scientists not being able to convey it in the right way, and that, that takes time. So I think that it's incumbent on us to really try to understand, in that case, politicians. That's maybe not the best example because that person might be you know, oblivious to all of that, but I think, we can change ourselves a little bit, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, by the way, there was a CNN uh, reporter named, uh, oh my God, I forget his name. He, I'll, t I'll remember in a minute. He went to uh, the most skeptical county in America on global warming in 2015, and he did a report from there. He interviewed people. This was a Yale study that had done a county level uh, analysis of people's <laughs> views, and the first minute was all, from our perspective, kind of depressing. Uh, you know, this very nice looking lady, older woman says, out here, you know, Al Gore's name is like a cuss word. And uh, this oil company executive says, um, uh, well, you know, God controls the environment. So you're thinking, okay, this is gonna be challenging. And then the second, it's only three minutes. Uh, it's Woodward County, Oklahoma. Anyone from Woodward County? <laughs> anyway, uh, the second minute and a half is, um, 
the guy who said God controls the environment says, you know, we have, we're co we have half of our roof covered with solar panels now, oh. and we're going to cover the rest of it. And when you dig in, and the reporter followed him to his home and saw that he had a garage full of more panels, the thing that his zeal for putting panels on his roof is the same zeal that would guarantee he would never vote for a Democrat. It's his cultural, he's a libertarian. He wants limited, he doesn't want to pay a check to a utility if he could do it himself, and he doesn't want government telling him what to do. So if you went into that town and not had the meal, you know, had a conversation, and you thought you had to make him believe that global warming is the most important thing in the history of the world, then you're not only counter, you're really counterproductive, you're just starting from, starting from setting yourself back way behind the goal line in football parlance. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question right here, and then uh, let me see if there are more. Chick Feldmayer, and I'd like to ask your help. From a scientific community and an academic community, it seems your papers are incentivized based on the weight of the paper. And <laughs> that gets very difficult. You talk about connections and communications, and having asked scientists to put what, they have, what their idea is on one piece of paper, it's like you are now guilty of heresy. It can't be done. And to put one or maximum two recommendations and taking that to members of Congress to implement changes to policy, yeah. we need to work on that. And how do you get students and even the current scientific communities to feel more comfortable with that? Because if we're really going to make progress, other than all of us leaving here and singing kumbaya over <laughs> a drink or something, how do we go forward on that? Well, I've got, I, I've got a very particular view on that, which is that I think that the universities, the academic institutions are not well versed in this. I think what they were very good at, and we've mentioned it, is they'll train young researchers on how to communicate, or how to give them the journal, journalistic skills to, to sell their science. But I think the problem still comes that most academics, most of the materials that come out of universities and academics are driven by the academics. They're, they're, it's their thing. It's, it's kind of like in the business model, it's a make and sell stuff. You've got a production line, you get the stuff going as cheap as you can and you send it out the door and you just think that you just have a sales team that says you need this, buy it. And, but I think the other, the flip economic model is, a, is one which is a kind of sense and respond model, which is something that the media works on. It's a model that says, who, what is the customer model? It's a public one. What are they interested in? So most of the television programs I've made have come from tap that side, you know, what are people talking about? Let's make a program on that. The trouble with that is that then it's dependent by the fickleness of the public. And like I said earlier, the short term, that's, they're both short term mechanisms. Yeah. So I think that, that what the academic institutions have got is realized that media is important, we can dress our science up and we can sell it better. But both of it misses the longer term things. And what's really interesting, there are businesses now, your Patagonia, your, that are looking at social value and ethical marketing. And what they have is they have a purpose-driven agenda and they have this guide and co-create. So they say, we know where we're going. There's a roadmap of 10, 20, 30 years. We think we know the starting route, but we need to engage with communities. And that requires an organization at that fundamental level to have a sense of its long-term mission. Yeah. And from my perspective, and I may be talking out of turn here, but I don't think universities have that. I think they have short-term economic models, and they have a longer-term social value around training critical thinkers of the future. Yeah. They don't say, in 50 years, we have existential threats, and we need to completely redesign the model. And I think until we have a complete regime change, then we're really just tinkering at the edges. Yeah. That's interesting. It, it just makes me think of the old... U.S. model of the uh, extension that the land grant universities exactly. have to to advise farmers on how to grow their crops best and how to make you know like I call my extension to figure out which kind of plum tree to plant in my but it would be great if we had a climate change extension <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and well I, in a way yeah, I was just gonna say that's kind of yeah I mean it I think that's a great idea and in order to do that you need to change the system at universities because right now they're really focused on training individual scientists to be better communicators mm -hmm. instead of building teams of communicators. So scientists are trained for 
many years through their PhD on a particular subject. To smaller become, and smaller. Yeah, to become an expert in it. But the person who does a master's in communication also has an expertise in to combine people mm -hmm. rather than just train the scientists to be a better communicator, but train them to be a team member of storytellers. Then you're able to reach a much bigger audience and both the communicator and the scientist can learn from each other and work better independently and interdependently. One little fragment of that question too is about one thing the scientists are really par get paralyzed around in my experience and is, is communicating uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, climate change is, has deep uncertainty. The things that we know about it are, that are profoundly certain are that it's real and that the world's getting warmer because of gases that are in the atmosphere that we're adding. But also, we don't know how hot it's gonna get. That's profoundly understood. The uncertainty is deeply known. And that, you know, so just saying, finding a way to say uncertainty is different than ignorance. Mm -hmm. Scientific uncertainty is bounded plus or minus something or other. And that gives you actionable space. And, and there's more to it, because uncertainty suggests there's a kind of certainty there if only you could find it. Exactly. Most of the things we deal, do, deal with are deeply ambiguous. There's an ambiguity to the right. whole thing. Right. So you really can't get certainty. Because right. actually a lot of it's human behavior and political change and things you really can't understand. So. Uh, other questions? Uh, Mike Renner's run. <laughs> <laughs> this woman right here. Is it on? Yep. Oh, perfect. My name is Anna Tammy. Um, what do you think about the role of formal education in creating change? Um, I realize it's more of a longer term solution. Um, so particularly from that angle, what do you think is the value that it adds? And is it, is it a, a wise idea to spend efforts trying to make those linkages to, to put environment climate change as part of a formal curriculum in schools versus investing that effort um, into sort of short term efforts around communicating and um, advocating? Thank you. Leland, you're, you have that STEAM yeah, steam gene. I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think one of the things that we must do in our education system is to allow students to have experiential learning. Mm. Yeah. I mean, 80% of our, 85% of our knowledge comes from out of school time learning where you're experiencing things and not filling in bubble tests. And so if we can somehow get that type of activity back into the schools, to allow kids to go outside and look up and make a connection with the scientific method of why is this tree bark on this tree? You know, what, what is what is in this lake? You know, let me do a little sample and, and make the measurements and say that oh, there's acid rain that's coming down that's affecting the this this lake. How do we how do we mitigate that? You know, what are the other systems that are connected to it? So I think that's something that when I was running NASA Education, we were always trying to give kids activities that they could do and the lesson plans with their teachers so that the teachers could understand how it related back to a mission that was going on or satellite information or satellite data. So I think the experiential piece is, yeah. is critical. One of the, w one of the uh, most dynamic explorers at the festival this week was Jim Bentley, who's in Sacramento area, and he's kind of like this dynamo uh, for... Uh, he is, go, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know, he, his whole thing is place-based learning, inquiry-based learning. My wife yeah. is a... Is a teaches teachers how to do that stuff. Uh, and I, I couldn't agree more in that sense. So a big round of applause for- Love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the only thing to be provocative though is that the pace of change, the next decade is a critical decade. Yeah. And I think that you know, putting the onus on the next generation to sort out the problem is a, so we, we need to put into the schools and it needs to run and there's lots of great stuff to do. But that probably isn't going to save us from, the, you know, this next decade is pretty critical. And I think, so we need a different strategy for, for doing that, I think. Well, this gets to the question, well, this gets to the leadership question. And, you know, the thing that got you into space was the space race. The thing that got the space race made it possible was technology and basic inquiry and science. So all the science that's in a Tesla came from the space race right. and the Cold War. It didn't come right. from Elon right. Musk. So how do you, how do, do you have a sense of, given that Zoom <laughs> trajectory we're on, how you, can we build that without having a Cold War? <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the thing that can get us as a species, if not individual countries, 
really capturing that sense of urgency that you've just described? I, I guess the one good thing about the interconnected world is that sense of a potential global community. I mean, the fact is that we instantly can see what's happening in the other side world, and it freaks us out. So it makes it look like a really terribly dangerous place, even though, and think in terms of conflict, this is one of the quietest times we've ever lived in the human history. Right. So I think that that your sense of the how, how do, perspective. Yeah, and I think that's got to be that thing. It's the only thing that's really going to do it. So you can you can hope to overturn the global economic model and change globalization, get back to a different kind of economy. To my mind, that's never going to happen because of time. Or you could use that global connectedness and the fact that there are corporations out there that now equate social value to some extent the same level as financial value to think that maybe this that global system could sort it out. But so yeah, it seems. I mean, the, the invoking the Cold War kind of brings up the question, which is, can you have this global community, this one Earth, without an enemy? Right. Right. And it could I kept waiting for climate change to be that enemy yeah, right. that would bring us all together, and instead of you know. Yeah, Will Smith, Will Smith, Smith and Independence Day had the enemy yeah. coming. Yeah. Right. right. But Common we enemy. Tried, Everyone right? comes yeah. together. Right. right. But yeah. it, it hasn't quite happened that way. Instead, yeah. we're fighting each other over whether the enemy even exists. Right. I don't think in in the real world the environment is that big. We can't imagine it to be our enemy because we imagine humans to be our enemy. Because science communicators and just the how we tell stories about and the words we used about climate change, we were posing it in a conflict for quite a while. We used things like war, right? We used fighting, combating climate change. So I think there was there was at one point an active effort to frame climate change in this conflict base because we learned from the Cold War that this is what motivates. And it just didn't take because it's a lot easier for people to imagine the Soviets as their enemy yeah. than a hurricane that may or may not come this year. Yeah. So we're coming toward the end of our discussion and getting ready for this jump to uh, the, how do you restore balance and you know, balance to what? So I wanted to capture a little bit of your sense of what that balance could be like. How much of it is, you know, knowing the diversity among us, that there's that guy in Oklahoma, it was John Sutter, was the CNN reporter, who's been in Puerto Rico for months reporting on their disaster. Um, you know, can we work with us as opposed to creating a gene to fix us? <laughs> Is it, are we okay? In other words, as a species, you know, it's been our diversity in a way. And, uh, you know, there's edge pushers who go into space. There's group huggers. There's the tinkerer and, the, and there's the, Go it alone, or you know, is it, are we okay, or not? And you know, so some sense of what balance would look like as a little teaser toward our next, uh, our next conversation. What do you think? I, I, I get back to this, but I'm, I'm like a dog with a bone here. The more that we can get people together, talking about things, yeah. and bringing community, because we're, we're, we're divided by tribes right now. Everyone's in their little space doing their little thing. And uh, to sit around that table and, and have the conversation. I mean, Anthony Bourdain did that so well. You know, God rest his soul. Yeah. Going around the world, bringing people together over a meal, and and to hear those problems. I can imagine a, a kind of a radically weird and strange world where things are not where they used to be, but that there are a lot of them. So uh, right now, the only wild camels in the world are in Australia, um, and and and. and Maybe that's okay. Maybe maybe we end up with a world where there are wild, you know, camels in Australia, but at least there are wild camels and tumbleweed and tumbleweeds uh, <laughs> here. So a kind of a mixed up, hybridized world, but a world that I think we could have more of it be not us. There you go. I, th I think for me, trying to influence that wider public is such a big mammoth task. I think it's easier, certainly from my perspective, to think focus on things you can probably change, and I think. Changing that scientific community to be more embracing, more interdisciplinary, more eth thinking ethically, I think that's something that's actually within grasp. Yeah, and any last thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it's just inviting more people to the table to break bread, and mm. then by doing that, widening who we think of as decision makers. Yeah. It's not just Scott Pruitt, it's not just who's here in DC, but thinking of the leader of a 600 person community as a decision maker, that's how you get yep. change, right? It's widening our perspective. And the last thing I would say is that that same meeting at the Vatican, 2014, Walter Monk, who was one of the great quantitative oceanographers in history, uh, he was 96 then, he just had his 100th birthday out at Scripps 
uh, this past fall. Um, I was sitting with him at the end of this meeting, in a week of science and economies, you know, yammering, and, and I said, so Walter, what's gonna take? And he said, uh, I, I kind of figured he was gonna say fusion or you know, some great scientific thing. He said, it'll take a miracle of love and unselfishness. And I thought that was uh, very special. Um, because in other words, we don't really know. Right. We don't know. Um, so let's go forth into the next panel. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.